From Moment to Movement with Tamara Banks has been made possible through the generous support of the Anchor Point Foundation, helping nonprofit organizations and leaders creatively solve problems in their communities around the world. Racism is steeped into the very core of this country. And now, in 2020, black voices are tired of being ignored, muffled, and killed. Millions of Americans are demonstrating, protesting, to make their voices heard, especially black Americans. A movement has to arise from the ashes of the moment. From Moment to Movement is a series of one-on-one -on -one truth-telling conversations with the black community aimed at working towards addressing police brutality and changing systemic racism. Our guest today is J.C. Futrell, a Denver spoken word artist, teacher, and creative and all around great guy. <laughs> JC, thanks for, thanks for being here. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, uh, I just realized that my phone um, is still giving me alerts, so I just had to <laughs> shut it off. Uh, today is a really big day for us uh, today, and uh, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later. But thank you for having me. Um, my family knows you well, and uh, we're really excited about uh, doing this today, so thanks. Yes, yes, a little bit of background. The Mosleys are a impor very important family in uh, the state of Colorado. And your grandfather was a Tuskegee Airman. I've done uh, multiple stories uh, with the Lieutenant Colonel. And then your mom, the first African-American, your grandmother, pardon me, to, yes. first African-American uh, to serve as a city council person in Aurora. It's, uh, they're amazing people and your whole family is great. And you, um, just to give people some context and background, you're working hard to have their name and legacy live on through the renaming uh, a neighborhood. Uh, for those folks who aren't from Denver, Stapleton is a neighborhood in Denver and Benjamin Stapleton was a clan, not just member, but a clan leader uh, in uh, first elected, I believe in 1923. So talk a little bit about your efforts to, sure. to change the name from Stapleton to something different. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, this this name change uh, process uh, it has been one that uh, hasn't started, you know, in this particular moment, but we're hoping to finish it. Uh, the idea of changing this name uh, from uh, Stapleton to anything else uh, has been widely talked about uh, for uh, not only the existence of the Stapleton neighborhood, but back when Stapleton was an airport um, as well. It's widely known that uh, Benjamin Stapleton was a, uh, a Klan leader um, and responsible for uh, multiple acts of terrorism um, against uh, people of color uh, here in Denver uh, since you know the early 1920s and in 23 when he was uh, elected. Um, and so right now we are in the middle of a, a very interesting um, movement. Uh, this movement has really been pushed by a lot of uh, change leaders and uh, civil rights activists um, and concerned neighbors and community members, uh, you know, for decades. Um, we really are, are just pushing, um, you know, or pulling ourselves over the finish line here um, with this. And so I wanna give a shout out, you know, to uh, Black Lives Matter 5280 that took this uh, name change process back up again in 2015. And uh, people like uh, Brooke Lee, who also supported that as a resident. Um, of Stapleton as well. And so right now we found ourselves in this moment after uh, Tay Anderson made a very public call uh, just recently on CNN for the Stapleton neighborhood to change its name. Um, and the uh, Homeowners Association responded uh, to that call and uh, very quickly uh, pulled an emergency vote and all of the delegates on that uh, Homeowners Association uh, decided uh, unanimously that they would go ahead with the process to change the name. And this was just a few weeks ago. Uh, as that happened, uh, residents in the Stapleton neighborhood started coming up with names that they thought would be, uh, you know, acceptable uh, as a name change. And it just so happens that uh, my grandparents' uh, last name, the Mosleys, uh, came up uh, from a random resident that uh, no one in our family knew, um, but he knew our family and our family's history. Uh, and then that information was then passed down the line and it got to me and uh, I thought it was an amazing thing and reached out to the rest of the Mosley clan and asked for their uh, permission to go ahead and pursue this. And uh, here we are 
uh, 25, 26 days later in this process. And today is a very interesting day because the uh, residents actually get to vote today. There have been several straw polls. Uh, out of those straw polls for possible names, there have been 331 possible names. And out of that 331 possible names, uh, it is our hope uh, as the poll goes out today that uh, Mosley will be one of those names that's on the ballot that I think gets whittled down to nine. So it went from 331 possible names to nine today. Uh, and we're pretty hopeful that we're going to be on that list. Wow, that is so exciting. Congratulations to make it this far. That is so cool. I'm thinking about um, uh, the Colonel and, and Councilwoman uh, Mosley sitting up there in heaven. And on one hand, we have the potential uh, for a neighborhood that has for about, I'm trying to remember how old Stapleton is now, probably what, 12-ish years? I think a little bit more than that. I think closer to, to 17, 18 years. Okay. Uh, Stapleton's been around as a neighborhood, yeah. Okay, named after a Klan member. It's yes. not a surprise, it wasn't a secret. People knew, and if they didn't know, they have since learned over the past uh, almost two decades, and there's been pushback to change that name to anything. <sighs> Yes. other than Stapleton, uh, yes. sort of the attitude has been um, get over it. So right. there's a potential for this um, neighborhood to be named after some uh, African-Americans. And then on the other hand, we see more and more videos, evidence of what we all have known in the black community since bringing, being bought, brought over to this country as, uh, as livestock. Um, not human beings, that systemic racism is alive and well, and police, police brutality is part of that fabric and sort of woven into the fabric of America. When you sit back and look at those two places that we're at right now, JC, what, what do you think? What goes through your mind? You know, I think um, I'm, I'm saddened uh, that it has taken such uh, brutality and violence uh, for us to come to this point. Um, I'm saddened that it's, uh, you know, also taken a pandemic uh, to allow people the space and the time to reflect um, about their roles in society uh, for us to be able to even come to this moment. I think that there have been a lot of factors that have come in. I think the fatigue of uh, so much cultural discord um, you know, not just back with the last four years, but we can even say the last 12 because of uh, this counterculture push uh, against equality, against uh, equity, against fairness. Um, I think that with all of these things culminating, um, it has allowed us this moment uh, to be able to say no more, um, that we are all part of a, uh, a, a wider ideal and when we're looking at you know documents like the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution that were not written for uh, people that look like you and I, um, but we've always believed that there was a possibility that one day that those things could uh, apply to us. And I think that this moment right now is a moment where we do not have the luxury of letting up off the gas, that we have been given an opportunity here to demand the very basic things, not even the things that we need uh, in order to become fully functional and productive members of this society that have the same uh, rights and privileges as those uh, that, that claim it um, as their legacy. Uh, but just, just to stop killing us, just to give us the basic dignity of being neighbors and uh, uh, equals, um, I think is is the bare minimum. And if we can't get that in this moment, then we won't ever be able to get it. And you use the term um, moment, which is the whole purpose of this show, is to take this moment into a movement. And whether those um, feelings of and actions of racism are uh, the name of a neighborhood or being harassed and potentially beaten, if not killed by police because of the color of your skin, it's all the same. It's all on the same scale, right? I mean, there's no, well, that, you know, at least you just got stopped. You didn't get, I mean, it's still these microaggressions walking into a neighborhood or a school that's named after um, uh, a, a Klan member. A Klan member. 
Mm -hmm. Indeed. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. I just had a post the other day after having these conversations with, you know, uh, my white brothers and sisters, my black and brown brothers and sisters, my indigenous brothers and sisters over the course of the last few weeks here about this symbolism work. You know, the term microaggression has come up. And, and I really believe that, you know, microaggression is a term of privilege, you know, that to us is just aggression. Right. Mm -hmm. If you as a, if you as a, as a young person have to walk into a building, you know, with a Confederate flag, you know, hanging over it, that is a very aggressive thing. And you are reminded of that every day. You know, if we're people of color and we're getting, you know, stopped and harassed out in public, uh, the police being called on us for living while black, uh, that is a, an aggressive move. That is there's nothing micro about that to us. We I just took my family to uh, Yellowstone um, National Park and we had an amazing time, you know, but leaving, um, we stopped at the gas station to get gas. And a white guy got out of his car and told me to move my car along because I wasn't moving fast enough for him. Wow. And his family. He didn't do that to any other people that were standing around. He just saw an opportunity to come in and maybe do some bullying, you know, um, and uh, and it didn't and it didn't work. It, di it didn't work. Um, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I took a little extra time on that because the Kevins and the Karens of this world uh, need to realize that their time is over. They're done here. We, uh, right. we we've we've moved on. And so this work that we're doing, um, this symbolism work, we understand that it is just a first step. Uh, towards many steps that we will need um, in order to gain some equality um, and some recognition here in this country uh, that we are so deserving of. And I believe that the symbolism work is, 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 is really simple, that symbols uh, lead us to having dialogue and dialogue leads us to understanding and through understanding, then we can have some kind of reconciliation. Um, and, and that's the way that I look at this work that we're doing right now. Absolutely. One of the things that I hear um, a lot from people is that they're just so consumed with with what's going on in a negative way. They they just you know think the politics and the leadership of the country is not uh, the place where it should be, and um, they're concerned about, of course, the the pandemic. Of course, you know, hello, we're still Indeed. in a pandemic, and, and we've right. forgotten. But I know that um, some of my creatives creatives in my world are using this opportunity to sort of galvanize and use that energy to create something beautiful. You, I should mention, are an artist and uh, your artist stage name, if I may, is Panama Soweto. Tell me about the work that you're doing and, and have you been in, um, I don't know if I want to use the word inspired, but maybe motivated by what you've seen with the news reports of police brutality and, and so forth? <sighs> Yeah, um, thank you very much. I, I am a, a working artist and a touring artist as a spoken word artist. And uh, I'm also a, a painter and a photographer. Uh, and I have very much uh, looked to my art uh, to be able to make some kind of sense of this. As a matter of fact, my wife and I uh, are currently writing a series of radio uh, theater uh, uh, plays uh, that will be produced by uh, Donnie Betts. Uh, right here um, in Denver. And a lot of these stories are based off of our family stories um, at the same time. So the Mosleys will be living on through uh, radio theater here uh, pretty soon through uh, Destination Freedom. So uh, you might want to look out for that. Our first play is called uh, Give Me Liberty, uh, mm -hmm. a Freeman's Tale. And uh, it's uh, loosely based on the historical context that on my grandmother's side, uh, our great, great, great grand uncle was said to be or great great grand uncle was said to be the grandson of uh, Patrick Henry, the Patrick Henry. Um, and so uh, his life story is actually pretty amazing itself without even having that context. Uh, so we're telling his stories as a runaway slave and uh, what his life was like because that's been documented. And so uh, we're using our art um, in that way. Um, I've also commissioned other artist friends to help me with this campaign uh, to rename Stapleton. Uh, there are several artists within uh, the Stapleton neighborhood uh, themselves that have been creating uh, artwork for us, including architectural uh, images of what Stapleton could look like if it was renamed Mosley Park. Uh, hmm. We had a, a metal sign commissioned that was actually put up uh, in Stapleton, but then removed uh, by some, some no-gooders uh, <laughs> who uh, took it and probably destroyed it or hid it or something else, but we will not be stopped. 
a good friend of mine, Thomas Evans, uh, who goes by uh, Detour, uh, painted an incredible mural of uh, my grandfather and soon to be my grandmother uh, at the Stanley Market right there um, in uh, Stapleton. Uh, Becky Warren Steele, a good friend of mine, uh, created some buttons uh, for us. I've created some yard signs and uh, some other images uh, for this campaign. So uh, we believe that, uh, that our artists are uh, the ones that we look to uh, during times of chaos and uncertainty, right? They help uh, make the, the horrific palatable. Right. That's why we, we listen to, to, to people like, uh, you know, John Stewart or John Oliver, you know, Trevor Noah. That's why we go to them for our news, because they mix a little bit of their artistry in there to make it uh, at, at least um, uh, easier, an easier pill for us to swallow when we were learning of all these horrific things that are happening all around us. So art is that access point. We're using that currently. Right, right, absolutely. And it's a, a way to be a storyteller in a different kind of creative way than what I do. So, um, and it's important now to tell these stories because people are finally listening and uh, we wanna make sure that we capture uh, people's attention. So you keep on telling uh, good stories through your art and your spoken word. And um, by the time this airs, we will know um, if the new neighborhood will be called Mosley Park. So keep us posted. Absolutely. We're keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, as I said a little bit earlier, um, the vote actually goes live today for uh, the Stapleton residents. And so if there are any Stapleton residents, uh, you know, uh, that are going to be watching this after the vote has gone on and, and, and will hear these things, I hope that you have been inspired during this time. I hope that we have given you something to look forward to uh, our entire mission through this. Um, you know, e even though we're looking to get the name changed to Mosley, it's been more about sharing our stories and letting Denver know about the rich history of people of color here. You know, outside of my grandparents, we had Barney Ford, we had Dr. Justina Ford, you know, we had the cousins, you know, there, there's so many names uh, that we can associate, the Cowans that we, that we can associate with Denver and beyond um, that have contributed here uh, to, the, to the rich fabric of our Queen City of the Plains. And we just wanna make sure that that is not forgotten um, and that we are honoring those people that made it possible for this to be such a cool place to live. Right. J.C. Futrell, uh, Panama Soweto, you are amazing. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work and keep making this uh, place beautiful, this place that we call planet Earth and stay safe and healthy out there. You as well. Uh, we love you. Uh, we love your work. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. My family says hello and we will talk to you soon. Sounds good. And for all of you tuning in right now, uh, if you want more information about this program, just go to pbs12.org. I'm Tamara Banks. So glad you could join us. We'll see you next time. From Moment to Movement with Tamara Banks has been made possible through the generous support of the Anchor Point Foundation, helping nonprofit organizations and leaders creatively solve problems in their communities around the world.